Hello and welcome to episode 43 of the Roadie Rumble podcast. My name is Adam Bernstein. Today I have a very special guest. Uh, it is Bob Herzog. Zog is my former professor. He teaches sports journalism here uh, at the University of Rhode Island. I wanted to have him on for a while now. Uh, professor Herzog is a graduate of Syracuse University. He spent 42 years as an editor and writer in the sports department of Newsday on Long Island. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Uh, like I said, I wanted to have you on for a while. Um, some of the stories you shared, you know, during our class, again, unfortunately, it was on Zoom, but some of those stories that you shared from your career are certainly fascinating. And, you know, for an industry that I want to break into, it's always great to connect with you and have a conversation. So I appreciate it again. All right. I'm happy to be there. And this is on Zoom. And that's somewhat of the future on Zoom. So it probably wasn't the worst thing it to have the class that way because you kind of get used to, to um, taking part in Zooms. That was uh, um, a new concept for all of us, but I think we're, it's become part of uh, everyday life and I think part of journalism too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was going to say I started this podcast. I had your class in the spring, um, so about a year ago now, uh, last year, my sophomore year, but I started this at the beginning of uh, – the fall semester last year. So I came back after freshman year and everything was pretty much shut down on campus. And I was looking for opportunities to obviously network and connect with people. Um, and I decided to, to start this and I've been going through with it ever since. And it's crazy. So, well, but yeah, like you said, Zoom is, is the future. And I mean, without Zoom, I wouldn't, or maybe I would have this podcast. It would just be a lot harder to find people in person and sit down and do this. So it's, it's pretty cool that you're able to connect with anyone. Yep, that, that is, that's one of the uh, positive um, sort of side effects from, from the pandemic and from teaching remotely and learning remotely is Zoom kind of um, opened up possibilities for getting guests from out of town and speakers from out of town and, uh, instead of just relying on people local or on the campus. So that's a good thing, although uh, I'm not sure if you're going to ask me this or not, but I'm not so sure it's the best thing for um, readers and viewers of, of sports journalism to be relying so much on Zoom, but maybe that's something you will or won't want to get into, but I have my opinions about that. Absolutely. I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, just start talking. I want to get your opinion on baseball. Obviously, there's not much to talk about, um, but as of yesterday, February 15th, uh, pitchers and catchers were supposed to report uh, to spring training. So I just want to know um, you being, you know, a former beat writer of both the Yankees and the Mets, you being a big baseball fan yourself, you know, what do you take away from just all of this in the offseason itself? Well, there's a lot, a lot to discuss on that topic. But the big thing is that um, the sport is hurting itself by not, by not being, by not being a sport. Um, both sides are wrong and both sides are right. It's a, it's a difficult battle, but to the public, to the f baseball fans who, who are um, the reason that the sport exists, um, th they're being hurt by uh, some greed and some stubbornness on both sides who don't, see, who don't seem to get that it's the fans that make the game. And everybody involved in the game is well compensated, at least at the major league level. Can't say the same for the minor leagues. That's another issue. But the major league level, even the lowest ranked player is very well compensated compared to the rest of the jobs out there that you or I and others are going to, to be involved in. And so for them to be that short-sighted and to, to nitpick over some of these issues is, is bad for the sport. It's a bad look. And uh, so they're hurting themselves there. And I think they're also missing that the product needs some work. The product itself, not just the money issues that, are, that was the cause for the lockout and the cause for the labor impasse, but the sport itself has some issues with, um, you know, the way the game is played, you know, the, the, the home run strikeout walk three true outcomes issue and the, the, the perceived lack of action. And, um, and of course the tanking issues and things about the sport itself, and they should be addressing those even more, but they can't because they have to resolve the labor issues to even get back to the sport. So I, th I think the, um, 
parties that be are, are doing the sport and the fans a disservice, but um, they seem to be really entrenched and it's, it's much like partisan politics. They just don't seem to uh, want to acknowledge the good points that the other side is making. Yeah. And it's interesting. I wanted to bring up, I feel like a lot of sports, we don't really see often sports, you know, hockey, the NHL, the NFL, the NBA, they're not really getting edited often, or at least in these last couple of years, the rules aren't getting edited or changed. Um, but with baseball, we had similar to a lockout a couple of years ago. And then obviously the commissioner and some of the front offices needed to reassess and talk everything over with the 60 game season um, due to COVID. And now here we are again in a lockout. It's so frustrating as a fan of baseball to sit here and, you know, patiently wait. It's the longest season, but now it may not even happen. So it's, it's crazy because I feel like a lot of sports are not going through what baseball is. And to begin with, it's not the most popular sport anymore for younger generations. More and more people are saying that they don't want to watch baseball. Um, I feel like I'm the outlier in that situation, but me out of some of my friends are, you know, not so interested in baseball anymore. Whereas a couple of years back, it was America's pastime or America's sport. Well, it's true that um, uh, then it, Baseball is losing a lot of its younger audience, um, uh, and that has nothing to do with this lockout. But uh, yeah. you know, playing all of the World Series games and you know at, at night and late at night, so that a whole generation of young fans never even gets to see the showcase event of the sport is mind-boggling to me. They start the games at eight thirty of the World Series, so okay, and a dinosaur like me when the games were all at daytime, okay, I get, we're not going to have that anymore, but not to play any games in the day or not start them at six 30, like they do the super bowl. So you start the games at eight 30. So you're getting prime time money. And it's somebody smarter than me pointed out both Bob Costas and Jason Stark really recently addressed that in the short term, if you want to wring every penny out of the uh, advertisers for that, then they're doing the right thing, starting the games late. But if you want to, that's short term. But if you want to look at a big picture, long term, and keeping a gen, the fans and gen, the next generation of fans, you need to start the games at 6.30 or 7 so that kids can go to bed at 10 o'clock and have seen the whole World Series like the Super Bowl was over by 10 o'clock. And people can still go on to work the next day and talk about it. So, yeah, so advertising revenues wouldn't be as high. Or advertising rates wouldn't be as high if it's not all in prime time. I get all that. But it's still a great amount of money that you will uh, get from it. I think they're uh, missing the boat on that, but they're not even talking about that because of the labor issues that are, that are here. So um, I wouldn't say the sport is necessarily in trouble, but it's definitely a crisis that they need to deal with. And this is a bad look and, uh, and so far a bad outcome here. It is spring training would have started. It didn't start. We have a very small window now to get it settled before, before we're going to start to miss games. Um, Baseball and can't be blamed for the pandemic, of course, um, but they had to do something last year to, or the year before last to, to uh, accommodate that. And so they, they opted for the 60 game schedule because they couldn't come to an agreement on expanded playoffs or other things that might've been able to make the season longer. Okay. That was a fluke. Everybody had to adjust and no one had a plan B for that. Yeah. But this is, this is different now. And, um, labor peace is something we've had for a long time in baseball. Now that we don't, um, uh, th this isn't a, a, a really a good, it's not a good scenario right now, but by the time you, you edit this and put this out on the air, they, they may have resolved it, whether it's a satisfactory long-term solution or a short-term fix so we don't ruin this season. Not really sure what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope it gets resolved soon, but it's interesting because I was listening to John Boy's podcast. I believe it's Talking Yanks, the, the one where it's strictly just about the Yankees. Um, and him and his co-host had Michael Kay on recently. And, you know, their prediction was really that when this all gets resolved, it's going to be the best thing for baseball because free agents are going to be signing. They're going to have a week or two to sign. They're going to go left and right to all these different locations and then baseball will well spring training will start and then baseball will start and it'll just be so exciting and I really hope that prediction is true because right now I mean I'm looking forward to URI baseball because I, I just got an email the other day saying I'll have some opportunities to do ESPN plus some of the radio that I've been doing all year but that's really the only baseball I'm going to be watching or covering this year 
as of right now. So I really hope that prediction of, you know, free agents will sign, baseball will start, everyone will be happy, and this season will play, will be correct. And, you know, I think one of the – it was either Michael Kay or one of uh, John Boy's co-hosts was saying, like, that one or two weeks where all the free agents that did not sign prior to the lockout sign will be the most exciting thing. And, I mean, that – again, as a fan, that sounds so exciting. So we'll see. There's no doubt that that will happen because there's too many important and star players that want to get paid and want to play. So, yeah, there will be a flurry of activity. It'll be big news. It'll be great. Uh, of course it will. And why everyone doesn't realize, didn't realize that to get it settled even beforehand, you know, let's just see. They're really, they're really each side digging their heels in. Uh, but, yes, when it gets settled, and I don't think it's an if, it's a when, but it might take longer than we want. But whenever it's settled, even if it winds up being a short season, which will create a lot of anger and outrage, there still will be that flurry. There's important players uh, and teams that plan their offseason to get ready for next year. Um, you know, our Yankees included uh, have a lot of moves to make. Those, yeah. There's too many teams that can't start the season with the roster they have right now. Uh, so, yes, that, that, that's absolutely true. And, you know, whether it's the best thing to happen to baseball or not, remains to be seen because let's see what kind of a settlement they have and and what what else they do including rule changes and playoff schedules and other things um you know they're really only the only news is we think the universal dh is is going to be approved by both sides and that so that will be one dramatic rule change um again that's not the point of this entire podcast but that's something i think was long overdue um the game had evolved to where pitchers hitting wasn't really a part of it uh, you had a handful of good ones and the rest of it it was embarrassing to see how poor they were and I didn't think that was fun and I don't think strategy is what you know double switches is not what brings fans into the stadium action does and so DH is a better idea so that to me is a good thing but everything else is up in the air absolutely uh sticking on baseball for one more question before I jump into more of your background and you know uh, everything you accomplished in your career. I'm curious to hear your reaction. Um, this was probably one of my favorite lessons or conversations that we had in your class, but it was the Baseball Hall of Fame. So as a voter yourself and a lifetime member of the Baseball Hall of Fame, um, again, we had a great discussion about that. I'm curious to hear your reaction um, to this year's results, David Ortiz being the only um, elected to it, or to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Well, as, as I think that you know from, from class, because I retired and don't cover enough games, I no longer am a voter, oh, okay. um, even, though, even though I still am sort of a lifetime member emeritus of the Hall of Fame as far as free admission when I want to go and access to ball games if I want to go, just let them know and my Hall of Fame card will get me in. But voting, you need to cover X number of games every year, and it's in retirement, I don't, so... Uh, so I, I, I'm no longer a voter, but I'm uh, actively interested in the process, as you know. Um, and because I'm no longer a voter, I can say this with a clear conscience, that David Ortiz being elected is a sign of the hypocrisy of the voters. Um, you don't have to think, you know, he, he flunked the drug test. Now, is it a bogus test? That's what some people are saying. But at what point do you question the validity of a lot of the testing. Um, so uh, him getting in, will it open the door for others? I don't know, but Fonz and Clemens, two of the all time greats, regardless of what you think of their character, or even if they did, even though neither flunked the drug test, even if they did um, use steroids, there's, there's too much gray area on who else used it, how long they used it, and, and uh, and how much of their records are tainted by it. So they're not in now. Their 10 years are up. Um, they may get in after the fact on the Veterans Committee or the Modern Game Committee, whatever it's called now. So I, I don't know going forward what will happen if either of them gets in, or well, that probably would be a tandem. If they both got in by, the, by that committee, makes the writers look bad for not voting them in. And then going forward, does that mean all of the PED era guys that, that have Hall of Fame credentials um, will they get reviewed by that group? Uh, I, I don't know. And I think you know how I feel from, from what I said in class. I, yeah. I don't feel like you can have a Hall of Fame that purports to tell the history of the sport 
and not have Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, frankly, Alex Rodriguez, even though mm. people find him worse than the others because he f- was suspended for an entire season and, uh, you know, had two strikes against them. Same with Manny Ramirez, another one that's just about on that level of being an immortal player. Not quite, but the other three, Bonds, Clemens, and A-Rod, are three of the greatest players in the history of the game. Uh, I, I'm not comfortable with a Hall of Fame that doesn't have those people in it. Um, but my writing uh, peers, my brethren in the business, don't necessarily agree. But here's the thing. 65% of the voters voted for Bonds and Clemens. That's way more than half. It's a yeah. strong majority. It's just not... 75 percent so clearly more people believe they should be in than that they shouldn't um so i, I don't know and, and then changing the rule from 15 years of eligibility to 10 may have hurt them because the, their vote totals were going up if they'd been on the ballot for five more years or teases in raises a question about others some that may already be in the hall of fame that may have used peds so it's a it's the reason why it's the most interesting class every semester is because it's a Really interesting debate, a really interesting topic. No magic solutions. I don't have one, uh, but I believe they, that um, they, I, I would vote for, I did vote for them when I did have a vote and I would have voted for them uh, now. And, and I acknowledge, I don't, I don't condone cheating. I acknowledge that they, that they, they took PEDs, but um, they kind of were the product of that era, not excusing it, just explaining it. And also, this is the big thing to me. It's the history of the game. All those stats are official. Yeah. That's the thing. Those stats are official. Those stats count. Those championships count. They didn't take away championships. They didn't take away wins. They didn't take away those records. So if, the, if everything counts and it's right there in the history books, how can the Hall of Fame be telling the history of the game and not including them? How, how it gets implemented, smarter people than me need to come up with it. It's whether it's something that they acknowledge. I mean, if they put it on a plaque. I'm not sure about that because that's sort of telling everybody, uh-oh, cheat, not shouldn't really be in, but yet they're in. So, but yeah. do they want to create a wing, the PED era, have a plaque, uh, you know, a post or something that explains all of that. And then you see those bus, those plaques in it, whatever. I don't know. I don't, I'm not certain about that, but I, I still feel strongly that the, uh, that, that players with Hall of Fame worthy statistics, Hall of Fame worthy careers, um, regardless of their PED involvement, should be in. Yeah, and I think you bring up an interesting point, and again, alluding back to that class that we, you know, the interesting class that and discussion that we had, um, you really shifted my opinion there, because I think the way you worded it in class was, you know, when you take your kids or even your grandkids one day to the Hall of Fame, and that piece of history, you know, the steroid era is not there, you're missing a big part of history. So, I think, again, the way you worded it was the Hall of Fame is to tell the story of the game of baseball. And like I said, the steroid, the steroid era is a big, very big part of the story of baseball. So I almost agree with you there. Now, I didn't really grow up to see the Bonds and Clemens and Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire era. I was, I was very young. Um, but again, someone that loves sports and you know, sees the statistics on baseball reference and watches the highlights on YouTube. I, I can agree with you. I think there's a case to eventually or hopefully induct them into the Hall of Fame because they were great players, regardless of steroids or not. So, right, and it's a, it's a good debate. I mean, I get it. I'm I, I don't I don't endorse cheating at all. Uh, yeah. But uh, just it's just um, uh, the temptations were too great for some of these people, and so they did it. But not convinced we don't have inductees already that took it too. So, and there's too much gray area. They take it every day, only once in a while. How many years of Clemens and Bonds careers did they go where they didn't take it? And they probably already posted Hall of Fame worthy stats, possibly, likely. Certainly we think so in the case of Bonds and Clemens. So uh, it's a great debate. It's just, yeah. you know, I have an opinion, but it's just an opinion. There, right. isn't, there aren't right or wrong answers with that, but it's a, uh, very interesting debate. It's also very interesting that only the Baseball Hall of Fame engenders that kind of discussion. Um, the Football Hall of Fame, it's great, but it's usually, uh, it's about time. When somebody gets in, no one ever says they don't belong. It's just, yeah. yeah, he's great. Why wasn't he in sooner? There's so many great players in the 
so many positions on the field, at least 22 starters plus special teams. So let's say 25 players on, you know, starters every week. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, and hockey and basketball, you never hear about these arguments. It's just who's in. It's very rarely do you hear it. So um, uh, that's what makes the Baseball Hall of Fame discussion so fascinating. Absolutely. Uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, more so towards your background and, you know, your career. Um, probably our favorite question or my favorite question to ask on this podcast is, you know, what is your why? I feel like everyone has a reason or a motivation for why they do it. Uh, what is your why for, you know, sports journalism and just your career itself? Well, my why is because I loved sports so much as a kid that somehow that was going to be my life. Um, I wanted to play baseball. I wanted to be a major leaguer. So when you're young, you don't understand that those dreams are more dreams than reality. But, um, you know, I was pretty good, good enough to keep the dream going into my teenage years. And then I realized I wasn't a good enough player. Uh, you know, I played high school in one year at Syracuse, but I knew I wasn't major league material. Uh, but by that time, I was able to consciously decide, here's one way I can stay involved with sport forever. I happened to be a good writer. I was pretty good with the language, and I had a passion for it. Um, when I was younger, um, newspapers were more prominent. Uh, so I actually learned about sports and how to read from, from the newspapers. Uh, I've told the story before. My first responsibility in life as a five-year-old was to go to the corner candy store for a nickel, buy the New York Daily News, and bring it home to, to mom and dad. And so I wasn't reading it at five, but I was doing that all the way through elementary school, or, or, or at least for the first few years of it. And so at six or seven, I'm learning to read it. I'm learning to read from the big headlines on the back of the sports section and learning about sports and reading it as I'm walking home you know, the six, seven year old kid. And, and I knew more about sports at that age than, than some adults. And it just it was like pretty cool to be, to, to find something that you knew more about than adults. When you're seven years old and you know more about something than adults do, that makes you feel pretty cool. And yeah. so it's, I said, somehow this is what I want to do. And, you know, I was, I was thankfully I would, I was able to do it. Hundred percent. I can definitely relate. I I probably wasn't the uh, the best athlete. I I certainly tried uh, growing up. Had the little league, uh, Nass Nassau County little league, and and all of that um, behind me. But certainly wasn't the best athlete on the field. But sports is definitely, and I'm sure we can relate. A, a huge part of my life. I've been reading, actually, Newsday and and other so, uh, sources and newspapers. Um, now it's all online, but growing up, you know, on the Saturday or Sundays, uh, when I didn't go to school, my dad and I would sit down, I feel like, and eat breakfast and, and read the newspaper. I've been a diehard Yankees fan my entire life, and sports has always kind of been something that I've wanted to, that's always, you know, pushed me to come out of my comfort zone, I feel like, growing up, but now the opportunity to make a career out of it is 100%. I'm signed up to do it, so I definitely can relate there. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, it helps to have a passion for whatever it is you pursue in your career. So sports gave me that. And it's always helpful to be knowledgeable. Uh, I, I, I very rarely, I mean, in my career, very rarely was I not um, expert on the subject of, that I was sent out to cover. Very rarely. And if I wasn't, I just would read up on it and, and be prepared. But most of the time, you know, I, I, I might comfort zone to use your phrase was that I was going out to something I knew something about. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know, maybe know every player, but I wasn't going to see anything in the game that I didn't know or didn't understand how, what happened and why. So um, that, that just was something I was interested in. And I frankly like all aspects of journalism. I like being an editor. I like writing headlines. I like editing copy. I like making decisions on deadline. I like working with the writers to come up with ideas uh, I liked every side of it. So on the broadcast side, I would have enjoyed producing and directing if I couldn't be on the air. Uh, any of those things. Uh, I just like the whole process of putting together a product. Uh, in my case, every day, I, I yeah. really did. I did like, I did like it, and uh, yeah, I do. I miss that. I do miss that day to day, of being retired. I do miss that day to day uh, thrill of the chase, so to speak. I like. 100%. I like that. 100%. Yeah. 
Uh, so you're from Comac. Um, I actually had Coach Grasso, the Bryant men's basketball head coach, on uh, not too long ago. He's from Syosset. So, you know, it's always great connecting with Long Islanders uh, like myself, uh, as you already know. But anyways, you went to Syracuse. You said you mentioned uh, or you mentioned that you played a year of baseball there. Uh, what went into that decision to commit to Cuse? Was that on scholarship um, to play or was that no. just a school that stood out to you? OK, so there's actually a good little story on that. Um, <laughs> when I was in high school, uh, the high school guidance department processed three applications for every student. In those days, it was not an online process. It was all done with paperwork. You had to go to teachers, get them to write rec letters of recommendation whatever. So we all picked three schools. Now in, in New York State, if you live in New York State, they had something then called the Regent Scholarship, which would, I scored well enough on that exam that I qualified for that. And that only was good in a school in the state of New York. So that was going to help towards tuition. So I only applied to three schools in New York State. So I applied to Stony Brook, a state school that was kind of a safe school, even though it's an excellent school. Uh, then uh, NYU, which had a journalism program, but it was actually a graduate program, but I kind of had a connection there. My high school basketball coach used to be the, um, an assistant coach at NYU, and so he wanted me to go there. And then Columbia was my long shot. So I applied to three schools. Okay, before the applications were, you know, before we heard back from any of the schools, my guidance counselor gets me out of class one day in school and says, Bob, I apologize. You know, what's the matter? He said, I, you're, you want to be a sports writer. You want to be a journalist. How could I forget? Syracuse has got this great program. And I, I should have told you to apply to Syracuse. So he said, I'm going to approve a fourth application that we will, we will process for you. So I did. So I applied to Syracuse. That was my fourth school. And when my kids went to school, they applied to 10. And people were applying to 20 and 30 schools. Yeah. So totally different. So I, I applied to Syracuse as my fourth. And, um, and uh you know, another little anecdote is so I come home, come home from school one day and my mom, God love her and may her soul rest in peace, was very enthusiastic and passionate, but sometimes out of control. She comes home and she hugs me, Bobby, oh, Bobby, I'm so happy for you. I said, what happened? And she, she opened my mail and it was the letter from Syracuse saying, I, not only was I admitted, which I knew I would get admitted, but they offered me a partial academic scholarship. So that's you know, I didn't even get to open that letter myself. Mom did. But uh, that, you know, I got into NYU. I got into Stony Brook. Um, but and Columbia was a safe school. And I would would not have gotten in until that summer when I, they finally did tell me it was that summer too late. I would have wanted to make my decision well before then. And so uh, it was really was a no brainer because NYU, they had some aid package, but it wasn't a scholarship. Stony Brook was a state school, so it would have been cheap to live, especially if I stayed home. But Syracuse offered so much more in the terms of the program. Uh, and, you know, with the scholarship, it made it manageable for my father. And, and so um, and I went there and uh, no regrets. As you, you know, the line I've used to my students for, for a dozen years is I, I got my life and I got my wife. I met, yep. I met my wife at Syracuse and I got my career. So no regrets. Um, but I will say to personalize and localize this, URI has got a good thing going with this sports media program. I mean, it's given, um, it's, it's really good. You can major now in that. And, uh, the, you know, they're offering some good courses. They have a state-of-the-art uh, studio. Uh, um, they have the program where uh, there are opportunities to broadcast campus events uh, that, that they're doing. So I, I think it's a good program that will, will grow in stature and, bec and become more well known uh, for programs because it's relatively, relatively new as far as having a full-blown sports communications major. And uh, yeah, I'm very impressed, especially with the multimedia stuff that they're teaching all of you students like this, like every kid that comes out of URI knows how to do podcasts, uh, video, um, web stuff for the web, all the things that uh, are part of, of an ever-changing business. It isn't just one thing anymore. Everybody is a walking, talking, multimedia entity. And I think URI is doing a good job of preparing kids for it. And same with Stony Brook, the school that I taught at before I, came, I retired it and started teaching at URI. Same thing, they're understanding that uh, multimedia is, is definitely how the, the business is going in the future.
Absolutely. Um, as you said, no regrets, honestly. I, I can definitely say the same about URI. I, every opportunity that I've gotten, um, I've taken. And, you know, it's I, like, you, like you know now, I've, I've gotten my first, I, I guess you can say, official internship um, for this summer. I'm going back to New York. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'd, if I'd want to live full time as a Rhode Islander yet, um, maybe down, down the road, but um, I am a, a Long Islander and a New Yorker at heart, um, especially on the sports side. But yeah, again, like Rhode Island and, and what URI has offered um, the students and especially me is something that I, I couldn't pass up on. And I'm very grateful for the connections and even through this podcast, like the connections that I've been able to make and everything like that. Um, and going back to Zoom again, I've been able to Zoom with former URI basketball players that are now playing overseas in countries like Slovenia and Croatia and things like that. So it's just, you talk about the multimedia aspect of it and it's so, you know, in your face for, you know, when you get here, but it's also when you find like what you want to do and that passion, um, it's really cool. And some of those opportunities that I was talking about before. So yeah, definitely can agree. Yeah. And, you know, like, uh, again, somebody much smarter than me once said, if you pick a career where you enjoy what you're doing, then you never really work a day in your life. And I, yep. I can I, I can say that that's true, that, you know, I, I can't remember very many days that I didn't look forward to going to work. So that's pretty good. It's not always about how much money you make. It's it's yeah. how much you enjoyed your 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 time. You're spending going to spend a lot of time in your life working. So, it, yeah, to me, if it if it doesn't feel like work that that's a victory. Absolutely. Um, so you talk about that passion growing up for sports and sports journalism. Um, and we talked about you coming to Syracuse. Were there extracurricular, you know, extracurriculars on campus, whether that was radio or I'm sure you were involved in newspaper there um, that you were involved in. And then also going off of that, did you have a professor or a mentor uh, at Syracuse that pushed you and maybe helped you break into this industry? Uh, yeah, uh, many. Um, and actually, I have to go back just before Syracuse. My, uh, I had a wonderful um, gentleman, uh, Arthur Thibodeau, who was my, uh, he was the journalism advisor at, in my high school. And I never actually had him for English, just, just the way it worked out, but he was the advisor. He really helped me a lot because I was playing ball. I was playing basketball and baseball my senior year. And he, but he wanted me to be the editor-in-chief of the high school paper anyway. And he said, don't worry. I'll, I basically, that wasn't the expression then, but he had my back. So he would, on days that I had games, he'd make sure the articles were in. Sometimes he'd help me. He, on his own time, he would copy edit some of them for me. Uh, you know, we, it was only a monthly. So it was those weekends when we were producing it, he would, and sometimes he went to the printing plant for me. He was wonderful besides inspiring me to do it. Uh, and at Syracuse, um, I had, um, uh, a slew of, of good professors. Um, the late Kathy Covert, what a name for a journalist, huh? Covert, Kathy Covert. Uh, she was a Washington correspondent and she worked in Des Moines and she came to Syracuse. She was great. She taught uh, history and communications, uh, law and ethics, and was very uh, a passionate professor. I liked her a lot. Um, she was my my favorite teacher and uh, dr henry schulte who worked at newsweek and was the dean he was he was also great um and then i worked for the daily orange the name tells you obviously so unlike the five cent cigar which is a very good paper i read it regularly and good stuff in there but it's not a daily so i and uh we had the daily orange was four days a week then five days a week at, at my time so uh I had many opportunities to write and edit, and I became sports editor my junior year. Most people did it senior year. I was lucky enough to get it as a junior. So I had two full years of, of doing that as well as being a student. So uh, in a way, I had two full-time jobs. Uh, so, so I kind of got used to budgeting my time, which is a big thing in this business, any business really, and yeah. um, got a lot of experience with deadlines and all kinds of things. And Unlike URI, we didn't have any sports courses at Syracuse in, in those days. No, no sports writing, no sports casting. You had broadcasting and news and investigative reporting and editing, all those things, but not specific to sports. So I, I, I wasn't getting anything in the classroom that was sports related. I was getting it on my own at the Daily Orange. So it felt like I was getting two educations in the classroom and in the field. 
and I also was uh, lucky enough to get an internship after my junior year at the Washington Post. So that in their sports department. So that was Syracuse obviously had a lot to do with that. And so I would say those are the things that set my post-college career in motion. Yeah. Now I remember you saying in class that out of college you only had, or you only worked for one company, that being Newsday. Is that that's correct? Um, I believe. Can you describe? I, I, no, I worked. I did work. Um, I I worked for four years before I got to Newsday. So I was in the okay. business for forty six years, forty two of them at Newsday. Okay. But out of college, I worked in. Um, before that, I worked in Buffalo. I worked at the at the uh, Newark Star Ledger, Buffalo Courier Express, and the. Uh, uh, a small paper in Pennsylvania, North Penn Report, in which I was a sports editor. So it, 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 in my early 20s, I had a job being, you know, doing everything. I was sports yeah. editor, sports writer, columnist, layout, everything. So I had three jobs in the first four years, kind of bouncing around, trying to find perfection. And uh, was lucky enough to come to Newsday as a copy, a sports copy editor, not as a writer. That's yeah. how I got to Newsday. It would have been harder to get there as a writer at 26. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I thought I, I might've told the class this. I thought I was going to be a sports editor for my, my career, uh, because my wife didn't really want me to travel. Um, and then late in my career, much later than most people in my late forties, uh, there were all kinds of changes at Newsday and I uh, used to write sports features and enterprise stories, even while I was an editor and they, they decided they liked my writing. A new person came in as the sports editor and wanted to have a new, new, people around him <clears throat> so they um made made change and made me a writer and my i started out covering big east basketball in st john's and yep. loved it and from yep. there i you know i went to did the pros colleges and high schools and uh turns out that there was a burning inside me to have been a writer even those years while i was an editor so uh i never really uh lost my enthusiasm when I switched gears completely. Um, but I, I think I was lucky in that I had basically two different careers. I had a career as an editor and a career as a writer and about 50-50 split on the number of years in both. So I really have seen both sides of the business or all sides of it really. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. I didn't, uh, didn't get to do quite as much as a writer as I might have if I had done it for the entire 40 plus years instead of only a half. But I edited and worked with writers who covered all those things that maybe some of them I might have gotten to myself. But, you know, I did a Super Bowl, World Series and Final Fours. I did those and, uh, you know, covered some big events live and yep. uh, luck, lucky to have done all those different things. And I, I love them all. Right. And just going back, I, I had questions about um, the Super Bowls and some of the sports and the teams that you covered. But going back. Um, my previous question was going to be how you landed at Newsday um, and just what that hiring process was like, because you talk a little bit about um, now having a couple of jobs out of college, working three or four jobs. Um, it's crazy that you had so much exposure to this industry at such a young age, just right out of college. So um, before going into a little bit more on Newsday, what was it like, I guess, landing at Newsday and coming back to Long Island? What was that hiring process like? So. Uh, yes. Um, back then, I still remember the, getting the numbers from editor and publisher. There were 1,800 daily newspapers in the country in 1972. <laughs> I have no idea how many there are now, but, but if there's 1,000, that'd be a lot. So many have folded or been absorbed, whatever. So there were jobs. Uh, and coming from a school like Syracuse gave me a lot of opportunity being a Washington Post summer intern, yep. who help, even helped separate, separate me from other very qualified people at Syracuse. So uh, having, I sent out 50 job, 50 resumes and, you know, cover letters and all. That's how you did it in those days. There was no internet. Everything was the old fashioned way, typed up, did 50 and got three job offers coming out of school. So uh, it's not a high batting average for baseball, but it wasn't too bad at, uh, for a job search. So yes. Um, and once you get a job in, in the field, if that's the field you want to stay in, you just build on that because the worst thing is you just stay at the one you have, even if it isn't the perfect job, at least you're working, continuing to be writing, editing, networking, whatever. So I kind of, once I got a job, I knew I was going to have one in the business. Then it was just, I always wanted to get to news dad, delivered it as a kid. I was a paper boy um, back when it was an afternoon paper, come home from school at two 30 and deliver the paper, different world. So 
that's where I wanted to go. My parents still live there on Long Island then. Um, it was growing. It was a big paper. It was one of the big, 10 biggest in the country. There was, just, you know, the New York market, familiar with Long Island. I just kind of wanted to get there. I would have been happy if the Post or the Times or you know, New York Times or Washington Post or big paper somewhere else offered me jobs. And when they finally did, I was already at Newsday. I, I did finally get offered jobs by the Washington Post, by the New York Times, by paper in Arizona. And by that time, I was in Trends at Newsday and didn't want to make a change. Um, so, yeah, I was lucky in that I got, was working right away. But I have to admit, I was kind of always had the, um, I was itchy. I wanted to, that's not where I didn't want to be in Buffalo. I didn't want to be in uh, New Jersey. I didn't want to be in Pennsylvania, even though each of those were good. I learned some things, did some good things there, met some people. But I kind of had my eye on, on Newsday even more than the New York Times uh, at the time. It was just the way that the paper was and being familiar with it, even being familiar locally with the high schools and stuff. So I kind of wanted to go there. Uh, and I was, so four years in the business, I thought they, they had an opening, somebody actually died and it opened up someone on a cop, an opening on a copy desk. So I went in to meet the sports editor and uh, you know, he saw my background and he said, st I still remember this. He, opened up his file cabinet drawer and he said, okay, so see this file cabinet drawer? It was stacked front to back. He said, that's how many applicants I have to want to be a writer. And you're 26. You don't have near the experience that most of the ones in this folder have. And then he picked one folder up, one manila folder and said, this is how many people I have who want to be copy editors in the sports department. So you're competing against a much smaller pool. I said, Oh yeah, I definitely want to be a, a sports copy editor and I'll show you that I can do it. Gave yeah. me a tryout, offered me the job in 1976, August 1st, 1976, I started there as a copy editor. So I still remember the stories I handled on my tryout. In May, the Nets were playing the Denver Nuggets in the playoffs with Dr. J. And I handled one of the nights that I was on the copy desk. I handled the night that they won the championship. Wow. So I handled some of the stories just you know, on a copy desk. I didn't write, but I, I wrote headlines yeah. on some of the stories, the sidebars, I guess, not the main ones. And I liked, I even liked that whole atmosphere of being involved. So yeah, once I got to Newsday, to be honest, I never looked for another job after that. People came and came for me because I got known for Newsday. Yeah. So I did have other offers, but I didn't actually pursue them. I was pretty happy. I mean, I did late, late, late in my career when MLB.com first came along. I knew some people there. And I sort of explored that, uh, <clears throat> that I initiated. But the truth was, even though I wasn't rich or anything like that, I was making more money than they were prepared to, to pay at that time. They could get a lot of younger people for a lot less money to start out. So it just didn't work. I was considering that because of having been a writer at that time, uh, of all the sports, baseball was the one that I kind of liked the best and would have been a big commitment, though because of the travel and the number of games, the time away. I don't know whether I would have taken the offer, but I would. that's the only job I actually pursued. Um, but yeah, I, I got to the job that I wanted. Um, you know, I used to deliver it as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old. I was delivering Newsday and thinking it'd be pretty cool to, to work here, so to, be, to be here someday. 12 years old, I probably used to like to, I think I said it at my retirement party. I said when I was delivering Newsday, I always said, gee, wouldn't it be great to be in Yankee Stadium someday. Well, I got to Yankee Stadium someday, but not not as a player. I didn't get to be a Yankee. I got to write about Yankees. So, yeah, uh, you know, Still in a funny cool. sort of way. Yeah, in a so funny sort of way, I got to, to fill out my, my dream. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's funny how dream. the, yeah. That's, no, that's, that's funny how the script changes uh, that way. And, and you know, it's, it's impressive, you know, what you've done in your career. And I want to ask you, you know, I did my research, so... At Newsday, I saw you covered, and, and you talked about it, St. John's and, and Big East basketball, um, the Yankees, the Mets, the Giants, the Jets. I know uh, you've talked about it plenty of times in class. You traveled to Florida for spring trainings. You had the opportunity to cover uh, local high school sports. I, I did my research. You covered three NCAA men's basketball Final Fours, five World Series, two Super Bowls, and three MLB All-Star games. I think I got that. Um, that's a lot right there. You, you could right. just share <laughs> Yeah. And that's and that's not even I mean, there's plenty of guys that have done twice as much as me. On yeah. That, but but that at least I got a, a sort of a, a sampler. You yeah. Know, 100 percent of, of, of some of the great things. Yep. 
Yeah, no. So if you could just share, I mean, whether it's a couple of stories or, or one memory that really sticks with, with you from all of that, I mean, what stands out to you? Uh, what's a story that you love to tell just from any of those experiences? Well, uh, so, so a single moment would be mm-hmm. not a World Series Super Bowl or Final Four, but was David Cohn's perfect game. Uh, now, sure. Newsday had a beat writer, a primary beat writer for the Yankees, a primary beat writer for the Mets, each of the teams, Giants, Jets. But, and I was the primary backup for Giants, Jets, Yankees, Mets for all four. So I would be there on many games as a sidebar writer, the second guy or the third guy in, because we'd have sometimes have a columnist and the beat writer. And then the beat writers had to get days off, so I would fill in for them. So I used to do about 75 games a season, Yankees and Mets combined, uh, all, all the home football games, you know, like a sampling of everything. One of the games, the... Uh, the beat writer came back from a long road trip and the Yankees were playing the Expos at the stadium Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Beat writers usually took that first weekend off when they came back after a road trip, unless it was Yankees Red Sox, to catch up, you know, just to kind of get back to their families or their lives and just catch up from being on the road. So I had the Friday night game, not the Saturday game because it was an afternoon game. Someone else, the great Mark Herman. Uh, he had the Saturday game and then I had the Sunday game just by luck. I would, I, those games were there. So that Sunday afternoon, um, David Cohn made history. Uh, so it was the luck of the draw, but I was doing the game story that day. I've been at some other big events where I was the sidebar guy. In fact, all those world series. And so I didn't do the game story. I was there doing sidebars, but that day I was the main Steve Jacobson was the columnist and that was it. It was the expos. We wasn't like, uh, we had to have three, four, five people like we did for the Yankees Red Sox or the Yankees Mets or the Mets Braves, whatever. Two was enough. So I was there solo, basically, for that. So as for a single event, well, of course, you want to write something historic. So, yes, that was memorable. You know the story in class that the, uh, you know, I covered the death of a high school football player. That's the story I received the most awards for. And, you know, it's memorable for a, it's memorable, but not for something good but yeah. memory can be for something bad. That was tragic. But the big events, um, my favorite of the big events, even though baseball is, is my favorite sport, was covering the final four. I love the pageantry and the excitement and the freshness of college basketball. <clears throat> and I especially liked it uh, two of the three years, or probably all three years, I did it from start to finish, meaning I had the first round, Like I had the conference tournament with St. John's in the Big East. Then I had the first round wherever St. John's went. If they didn't make it, I went somewhere else. So it was kind of fun to go somewhere when it's all back then it was 64, not 68. All the teams are in it and you got the oddball stories that, you know, I was covering Gonzaga when they were the Cinderella team, when they weren't what they are now, number one and in the tournament every year. They're an elite team now. When I was covering them, they were the truly Cinderella team. Okay, so uh, it was nice to, to see that and the, the sampling of teams from around the country and going to different places from one time a sub-region was in Florida, another time Tennessee, another time Texas, New Mexico, get to places in the country I would never have seen. And then, um, and then the final four. So I, I like the passion and the excitement and the variety of that and that pace for three weeks. Really enjoyed that. Um, uh, Super Bowl. I, I liked it because of uh, it was just to experience it, to say you've been there. It's such a grand spectacle. The game itself is almost the least important thing you do all week. You've got a week of stories to prepare for it. But, um, you know, m- my best writing in Super Bowl week was the week leading up to it because game day, I had a sidebar or two on tight deadlines and not as rewarding as the feature stories that you come up with during the week. Um, and, and the World Series and the baseball playoffs, journalistically, it's the worst. Most of the games are at night. <laughs> Even when history is being made, good history or bad history. I covered the, the 03 when the Yankees came back in the Pedro game in game seven, the Aaron Boone home run game. It was way past deadline. We were scrambling to just get a few things in the paper, come back the next day, the off day, because that, that was a game seven. You could catch up. And then the next year, the opposite. When the Red Sox came from all the way back, 3 nothing, covering all of them, being at Fenway, being in the Bronx, back and forth, and watching this history unfold from a Yankee standpoint, of course, negative, but still being a part of it. And, again, the lateness of those games, 
journalistically not as satisfying, not as rewarding, because you feel like you would have done a better story if you had a little more time. In some cases, you didn't even couldn't even get quotes. That's the nature of deadlines, and um, we didn't have as gr uh, as big an internet presence then. Our website was still being developed. Oh three, oh four. We didn't have what we have now, where you if you're writing for the website, you have time to get quotes and get something in there. So yeah, you you write for the paper, but that's only part of your job. In some cases, the less the least important because you the website's going to have the quotes and the more complete interviews with the post game press conferences. So um, each of them was was great to be at, but I mean, I can't say a single thing stands out. Um, hmm. The Yankees Mets Subway Series was a lot of fun in New York. The rest of the country didn't seem to care. Their ratings weren't that good. That was good because it was, you know you you would, you knew something about both teams. You covered them day in and day out. But that was also I mean, I mean I I had very few stories that would, were live. Everything I seen be writing for the day after because it was too late the night before because of deadlines. So. Uh, you know, some professional frustrations that you can't do anything about because of the deadlines, you do the best you can. But um, I, I like to just look back and say, yep, I experienced that. Yep, I was on deadline for this. You know, so I, I enjoyed the whole act of being involved in it. But um, there isn't like a single game or, or, a, or a single moment that, that stands out journalistically as a fan. Yeah, all of them. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I like I like the final fours. Uh, you know, I was doing sidebars, unfortunately, as I went as an editor to several events, too, that I didn't wasn't the main person covering. So I actually went to three more final fours as an editor that I don't really count as I but I did. Uh, you know, I did do sidebars live. I was there in 87 when Syracuse lost. You know, I mean, I had to really pull it together to be courtside and see that shot go in and see them lose and write sidebars on Syracuse, as it turned out. Uh, and I saw Seton Hall and Romeo Robinson in 88. And, um, you know, I saw you covered UConn's first national championship when they beat Duke. So, you know, those things were good. But I think I enjoyed some of the day off stories and features that, that I developed. Yeah. Apart from the games. But uh, it's more like a body of experiences, a body of work that I look back on rather than an individual thing, except for the ones that I mentioned. Yeah, it's crazy, like, hearing you talk about some of these stories and, and some of these games that you were at, whether you were there as an editor or you're writing sidebars, whatever it was. I mean, just to say that you were there for moments in history, you talk about the David Cohn perfect game. Um, that's incredible. I think every Yankee fan would have wished that they were at that game if they weren't at that game. Um, but say you were part of media um, or one of the final fours, I think every kid grows up. Uh, at least looking to pursue sports media, saying that they want to cover a Super Bowl. So um, that's that's really awesome to hear some of these stories. Um, what was I going to say? I was going to say, I guess now being in media, you know, me getting a little bit of exposure to that this year uh, with radio, I'm able to, you know, collect some of those credentials and media passes. I went to the dunk this year to watch the URI PC game. I've covered a couple of football games this year, some men's and women's basketball. I talked about doing the game tonight, which is a very big game. Can't imagine how many of those media passes or credentials you have laying around. <laughs> it's funny. I, I, it's funny you should mention that because I, I, I have a shoebox with them, but I actually got rid of some of them because I'm not – like I'm not a memorabilia guy. I don't really collect yeah. – I collect books. Mm -hmm. you know, I have books behind me. I have a library. But um, I just saved some of them, and I'm trying to think what to do with it. A friend of mine had – had created a collage of his many ones and then had it photographed and then framed. Mm. So I think that that would be fun to do. But um, right now I don't have, I have a, a nice basement office and a finished basement that the kids, grandkids play in. And uh, I'm looking around the walls are pretty much taken up with stuff, family pictures and stuff for the kids. Spider-Man is on the back wall there and the Disney characters and cars. So I can't really hog, the entire basement. It's not a man cave. It's a, yeah. it's like a den. So it's for everybody's use. Uh, so I'm not sure where I put that, but I've thought about it. I even arranged them one day and took pictures, but they're only some highlights. Like I never, I didn't save everything like some people do, but yes, I have credentials from those final fours, those Super Bowls, those world series, and, and then the, the playoff rounds, the, the pins and the badges. And yeah, um, sometimes I would wear them to class. You, you didn't get to 
experience that, but sometimes I would throw a credential around my neck to come to class if we were talking about the Super Bowl um, or the World Series, if it was in the fall, just, just for the fun of it. But uh, yeah, I mean, our memories are, are a big part of our lives, um, whether it's family memories, personal memories, uh, school memories and, and career memories. So yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And, uh, uh, you know, I have, I don't have tangible, uh, credentials and things for the stuff I edited, but many of those things were very, uh, rewarding and exciting. I was Newsday's Olympics editor for 20 years, mm. didn't go to the games, but I was the guy coordinating and talking to our writers halfway around the world in some cases. Uh, and you know, that was, that was, exciting whether it was 1980 the the, the uh, olympic uh, you know the u.s hockey team beating the soviet union in the semifinals and um you know editing those stories and uh each each olympics had its own moment certainly 96 in atlanta with michael johnson and carl lewis and all. i love the olympics so so that was exciting as an editor there's no credential that goes with it in some cases i saved a few special sections that we produced that you know that were that were good but uh yeah, and you mentioned spring training. That, I, I would say that after the final four, that was my next favorite assignment because journalistically yeah. that was, you were not really under the gun deadline wise because the, the night games, the games in spring training don't really mean anything. It's the stories about who's going to make the team and what's going on. And, and I, you know, who doesn't want to be in Florida in February and March? So that, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was, uh, you know, I used to do a week on each team the beat writers would otherwise be there for almost seven weeks and I would do fill in, give each of them a week off. So for about a four or five year stretch that, that it did, but I mean, there's people that in my business have been a 40, 40 years of spring training. So, and some stay for six weeks at a time. Uh, I, I never did that one year. I was there for six weeks because our, our Mets beat writer, Dave Lennon, who is now our award-winning uh, and outstanding MLB columnist. He was the Mets beat writer. Then he tore his Achilles tendon. His, uh, his Achilles um, playing basketball with other Mets writers uh, early in the day. Hmm. They had a, a group of writers, some guys golfed and some guys, you know, when there's night games and there wasn't any access, they would get together and play basketball. He tore his Achilles, couldn't work. And I was supposed to go for a week and my editor called me and said, uh, can you go for six? <laughs> so, um, my wife was not thrilled about that, but it was it was pretty exciting to be there for six weeks to kind of see the entire spring training uh, unfold. And he was out for uh, two months. So there was this six weeks of spring training and then the first month or so of the season. And that included a trip to Puerto Rico when the Mets were the first team to play in Puerto Rico when they played 18 real games in Puerto Rico, when they were considering that as a possible site for for the Expos to relocate. It never happened, but they looked at San Juan and they played 18 regular season games and the Mets played the first series there. So, uh, so, so that was very exciting to go to Puerto Rico and cover real baseball. And uh, apropos of nothing, that trip also included Miami. It just made sense. The Mets played in, in, in Miami and then they played in San Juan. So I went on that trip and that, that year, Syracuse won its only national championship in basketball. And we were in Florida for the Mets Marlins. And it was um, the day, an off day. And so I was in my hotel room and I was able to completely watch, not have to be at a night game, completely watch Syracuse finally win its only national championship in basketball and, uh, and be uh, a completely crazy fan in, you know, <laughs> In, in the privacy of my own hotel room, I could scream and yell and carry on and enjoy the moment and not have a job responsibility that night. A day before or a day after, there would have been a night game. So right. I still remember it was an off day and I happened to be there. And then that was just in the midst of that trip. So that's where I was when Syracuse won. But uh, yeah, it was fun. Puerto Rico was a, an interesting place to go to. So different to have fans that didn't have a team. They were rooting for the uh, Hispanic players more than they were a team yeah so uh, and, and then i wrote a couple of good features off of that trip that, that that made it worthwhile so yeah those that that was enjoyable that's awesome i mean just hearing the stories of being able to travel around the world and you know i mean cover some some teams and sports and like you just said it kind of fell into your lap you know covering that david Cohn game and 
um, if Lennon had never torn his Achilles, um, you know, being able to go and, and cover the Mets and then eventually going to Puerto Rico. So it's, it's those kinds of, I guess, like everything happens for a reason moments and, and things like yeah. that. It's not supposed to happen, but here you are and now you have a job to do. And that's, it's really cool hearing some of these stories. So that's awesome. Yeah, well, there's a quote, I think it's Mark Twain, but uh, it may not be. Uh, that's 90, 99% of journalism is just being there. Sometimes you just have to be in the right place at the right time. But, you you know, if you go to games, you, you know, you'll be there for something that happens. And if not, you'll come up with something because you're there. So yeah. I, I, I enjoyed going to ballparks. I like going and going to games. High school, too. I just like being at the games and coming up with the story. Uh, maybe not the obvious one or maybe something to go along with the obvious result, but then the other story, the sidebar of the feature. Uh, I, I enjoyed that. I, I, I had brought an editor's mentality to covering games. I would think about other stories that besides just the game, what other angle is there? So I guess my editing background really helped so that when I was at the game, I was kind of like an editor too, uh, yeah. thinking of, of story ideas and not just what was right in front of me. I did enjoy that. I, I, I enjoyed um, you know, all the components of of covering sports. Yeah. Um, one of my goals in life is is to go to all, uh, I should say, 31 MLB stadiums, or not stadiums, <laughs> but fields. Um, I say 31 because I haven't been to Iowa yet, but I have to see uh, Field of Dreams. But I have to go to all MLB stadiums and, and Iowa because um, I just, I, again, I love the game of baseball so much. I love that film. Actually, I'm in a uh, sports film class right now with Dr. Hodler, um, and I think he might be showing that film. We've, we've watched a lot of good ones. So, um, you know, hopefully I can and see some of the stadiums and some of the places that you've gotten to see uh, throughout your career. That's, that's really awesome. Yeah, I think that's a, 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 a part of the career that isn't really in the, in the uh, journalism textbooks or in, in the uh, – you know, in, in the rules of engagement, but that's a, it's a pretty good perk is to see the world. I, it was one of those silly Facebook things. It was a recent post that said, check all the cities that you've been to. And there are like 30 cities from around the world. I was only at maybe like six or seven. And it was only because of, of uh, baseball that I went, but I have a friend, John Johnstone, retired Newsday guy, was our Olympics guy, been around the world. He was at 24 of the 30 cities from around the world because of the, of the job. Uh, you know, taking you to places like the Olympics. Somebody is uh, Helene Elliott, who I work with at Newsday, and she's at the LA Times. She's a Hall of Fame hockey writer, but she's a columnist as well. She's in China for the Olympics. I think this is her 11th or 12th or 15th Olympics. So think of the places she's been and the credentials that she has. Um, uh, and John went to starting, I think, in 84. He was at every Olympics from 84 to whatever, 2004, before we kind of stopped going to everyone uh, because of finances and other things. But uh, that's a lot of places and a lot of things on your passport. Uh, so I did a very small amount compared to other people, but it, it, is, it is cool because, uh, you know, those experiences you, you remember and uh, get to share them with students and, and with my family. But yeah, I, there's a nice sideline of the job that had nothing to do with the actual product that I produced is the chance to see places I would never have been to. I think that's pretty cool. Cities that I would never have been to and get to see, you know, just cities in the United States that I, I would not have traveled to Chicago or, you know, maybe not Los Angeles, possibly family in California, but Kansas city and Cleveland and uh, you know, just around the country that there's something interesting about all of those places. Uh, and I like reading about them, Seattle, you know, interesting cities and uh, to, to actually travel to them is pretty cool. And you can't really be a tourist because you're, you're busy, you're on the job. So you're like, try to get a little something here and there. Most of the time, to be honest, it's hotels and restaurants that sports writers know more about yep. than actual tourist sites. But now and then, you know, I, you get to go to things, you know, I got to the uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame in uh, Ohio and uh, went to the Hockey Hall of Fame one day in Toronto. Um, and then I never got to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but 
got to see some things that I wouldn't have seen otherwise. So that's, that's pretty good. That's, that's part of America. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I have a couple of questions for you uh, remaining. Uh, so in 2015, you were inducted into the Suffolk County Sports Hall of Fame. So if you could just talk a little bit about, you know, what that honor meant to you and, you know, what it was like to receive that award. Well, thank you for bringing that up. It's, uh, you know, it's a regional thing. It's a provincial thing. It's, it's a county's Hall of Fame. It's not the state. It's not Cooperstown, like my good friend Jason Stark is in the, the media uh, wing of, of Cooperstown. You know, he's a genuine legend in the game. Uh, but it was, a, it was a great honor because it was um, recognizing what I did for my career. And it was, uh, so, so it's nice to be recognized for something you did that was a passion and that was your job and that, that somebody thought you did it well enough to, to, to be in. And, and I was in there for, I think I mentioned in, in my speech that I was in there for my writing even though they mentioned on my sort of resume that they presented for each person that that i played high school ball at comac and, and a year ball at syracuse and i was quick to say i'm not in the hall of fame for any of that i would have wanted to be but it was it was for my writing i think the, the joke i used was uh that was my high school baseball coach who i'm still in touch with he's in his 80s living in florida and he said uh take two and hit to write and i said no i i thought he said take two and stick to writing uh, I wasn't that good a hitter. Yeah. But, um, but I did, I, you know, it was, it was a great honor and I did get to have my, my mom and dad passed away that year before the, you know, before it. Um, but, but, uh, they were, I would, did tell them, I was able to tell them that I was going to be inducted before they, they passed. Uh, yeah. but I had my immediate family. I had my, my wife, of course, and then my, my son and daughter came down and each of their spouses. So it was a it was a proud moment for that. Newsday bought a table, so there were ten or twelve of my peers there, and yeah, it was it was it was it was a, a great honor um, to be recognized by your peers, and and it's the county that I lived in, the county I grew up in, in and uh, and the place where I work. So it was uh, a, a, a a great honor. It really was a, 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 and, a and a memorable night because I could share it with my family. I wouldn't nearly have enjoyed it as much if I just went by myself to get, to, to get an award. Um, and it also was good because I know in my heart, I know the main reason I got in was for the 10 years I covered high school sports or at that time, I guess I was whatever, six or seven years of it. That's where I got recognized locally by the community. So that's like what I try to tell students is never think of it as only high school. That's your job at that time. Do the best you can. Come up with stories. And so I did everything from the big to the small and everything in between. So I kind of liked that. I was probably honored as much for the local sports as it was for the other stuff I did and as much for writing as it was for editing. So it was like a recognition for the totality of my career. So I, I appreciated that. I really did. And it is where I lived. So it was yeah, it, it was a, a very nice honor. Thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> of course, of course. No, I, I, you know, my congratulations. That's, that's awesome. Um, again, I think that everybody um, who works for as long as you worked in this industry um, and it has done as much as you've done um, should be honored with something like that. So that's incredible that you were uh, finally honored with something like that in, in 2015. Um, and I'm sure it was definitely a memorable night for you. Um, a couple more questions, as I mentioned. I do have a couple of rapid-fire questions. You might have answered a couple of them. Uh, the first one I had for you was, you know, what was your favorite Yankee story or memory you can share from your career? And I know you mentioned uh, David Cohn. So if you have any other Yankee stories, maybe it was a spring training one, um, or, again, one that stands out to you, you know, what, what would that be? I do. I'll, I'll try to tell it quickly. I have a, a, an amusing story about Mariana Rivera. So – he is, of course, we know he's the greatest closer of all time with the most saves of all time. But my story involves him getting a save from me. So I had done a story about uh, a, a pitching, a feature on pitching and how pitchers over the years have adapted as they got older and how the game changed. And so they changed. And I interviewed a whole bunch of different pitchers, veterans mostly, about things they did later in their career when they weren't throwing as hard or when, you know, different reasons. So 
I had the story reported, but I hadn't written it because there hadn't been assigned a date for it to run. It was going to be a Sunday feature. I'm covering the Yankees at Fenway Park. I'm, I'm part of, of a team of us covering the Yankees Red Sox series. And on that Friday night, my boss says, calls me and says, I think I want to run this package Sunday paper. Can you write it? Uh, he knew I could write fast. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll turn it around. So and he called me before I left. So Friday in a hotel room before I go out to the game, I start writing it. And I had transcribed all of my notes, but not the Rivera interview. So I go to my tape. It's gone. I deleted it somehow. I mistakenly deleted a 15-minute interview with Mariano. And I had some notes, as I tell my students, take some notes, but I didn't have it complete. I needed that interview, and I couldn't finish. There was a sidebar on Mariano, or he was part of the main as well. I'm panicking now. So I get to the ballpark on Saturday to try to talk to Mariano. We have a heavy rain, and the game looks like it, and it did ultimately get rained out, which is good in some ways because now it gave me a whole extra day to write it, but it's bad in other ways because you had a very limited access in the clubhouse. So I go up to Mariano, and I tell him this, what happened, and I ask him if I can interview him, and he goes, I, I. first of all, he goes, how do you do that? That's your job. How do you do that? I said, I'm embarrassed to, to, to tell you that I, I somehow did it and I don't have all my notes and here I am and I need the story. And he said, well, if the game is going to get rained out and uh, in the last few minutes, the team is just getting together. They were, they were watching Gladiator. I still remember that. And it's a small locker room in Fenway Park, really small for the visitors. And they're all just gathered around the couches and tables watching Gladiator, and that's off limits. You could interview them at their lockers, but if they were at the table having food or if they were on the couches, I mean, you could wave to them, you could say hello, but you couldn't interview them. You could go up and ask them if they wanted to be interviewed, but usually it was like an inv invisible wall went up. They're on the couch, hands off. And that's where it was sort of like their little sanctuary, because on the road, they didn't have a private room like they do at the home locker rooms. So I slinked back and I remember standing next to Sweeney Murdy and he goes, what happened? And I told him and he, you know, he says, feel sorry for you, Bob. And then, so I kind of had my back to Mariano and Sweeney taps me on the shoulder and he says, Bob, I think, I think your uh, angel just landed. I said, what do you mean? He said, turn around, Mariano's trying to get your attention. I turn around, Mariano points at me and he goes like this. He got up from his couch, walked over to his locker room, did that. I walked over and he said, I give you a few minutes. I give you a few minutes. What a gentleman. So I pull out my recorder and my notebook. When I start to answer a question, he stops, he grabs my recorder, looks at it, he goes, is this on? Is this on? He wanted to make sure that I didn't screw it up this time. So I think I got about five or six minutes with him, but I didn't even try to take notes. I just fired away questions, made sure the recorder was going, got as much as I could. And if, you, if someone talks nonstop for five or six minutes, that's usually pretty good. And I got just what I needed and came back. And, and Sweeney said, uh, Mariano must like you, Bob. It was nice of him to do it. I said, yeah, he's good with everybody. He really is. He was a yeah. class act, win or lose, you know. Um, so I, I, I basically say Mariano got the save. My editors like the story, so I got the win, but Mariano got the save. Yeah. So that was one little personal interaction that, that, I, that I did that that's, I won't that's forget. One guy, that's one guy I'd just love to meet one day, if I can. I, he just seems like such a, a genuine, you know, guy, such a character. Um, yeah, he was a very he, humble he was, guy, you know, he was very humble for as much success as he had. And he was a stand up guy, uh, you know, in 01, when they lost to Arizona, he and he gave up the, the runs in the ninth inning. He was there 35, 45 minutes after the game, one by one, the Arizona riders were done with all of euphoria. And some of them came by to the Yankees room, locker room because the deadlines are different in Arizona. We were on terrible deadlines, but it was three hours earlier for them. So they had more time to flush out a couple more details. And then writers have been a half hour. They've been in there getting champagne on them and celebrating with Arizona. And they come over to maybe pick up a tidbit. And there's Mariano holding court 45 minutes later, <laughs> asking the same question over and over again. And, you know, just saying that's baseball. That's yeah. baseball. Uh, you know, I tip my, I tip my hat. I tip my hat, you know, uh, stand up guy, stand up guy, humble. And, you know, so it's a, it was a, an honor to cover someone who was the, the best at what he did. You know, you don't always get to do that. In New England, they got to cover Tom Brady, the best at what he did. Yep. Uh, you know, Michael Jordan, the, the best at what he did. Well, so as a relief pitcher, that little niche, he's the best in history. And to, yep. to have gotten to cover him was, it, it's an honor. Yeah. It, it definitely is. Yeah. And he was a good guy. Not every top player is also a good guy. Yeah. Or as best as we can tell anyway. Yeah.
That's true. Um, my next question was, who was your favorite athlete to get to talk to or interview? You might have just answered that one in the last answer. Well, I also, I, David Cohn was one of the best uh, because you didn't have to worry about him on whether he won or lost. He was also good if he lost. Other guys like Randy Johnson and Roger Clemens, you couldn't approach them if they lost most of the time, although they were civil but not necessarily cooperative. And on the days they pitched or the day before, they were in the zone and you couldn't even talk to them. So David Cohn, I remember well. I got along very well with A-Rod. Uh, uh, but one of my favorites was Curtis Martin of the Jets, Hall of Fame running back. He was the best. He was such a good interview. He was so smart, incisive, and win or lose. And during the week, he was uh, a good interview during the week. Uh, so he, he was my, my favorite uh, football player because he was really good with, with the media. And, uh, you know, he, he gave you the time of day. All, all the time, even when uh, things were going bad for the Jets. So I, I did I did find him to be a really engaging guy. Yeah. And then uh, two more questions for you. Uh, you might have answered this one in class. I know you definitely talked about it, but the craziest place or location uh, that you had to wrap up a story in order to make a deadline. <laughs> uh, well, in, in covering um, – so in – and covering local high schools and colleges, you can have all kinds of things. I got locked into the stadium at Hofstra, the soccer stadium, which is adjacent to the football stadium. After a, a playoff game, they locked me in. I was the last one in, but they, my photographer had just finished transmitting, and he saw the security guards. I said, make sure you tell them that I'm still here. Light was still on. He must have forgot. They didn't turn the lights out, but they locked it. And so I was probably 65, 66 years old. I had to climb the fence to get out. So that was, and I was hoping it was a low fence, a four foot fence. I'm no hero. I wouldn't have been able to climb an eight foot fence. Four foot fence, I was able to reach over, carefully drop my computer bag in case on the other side and shimmy and climb over the fence. And I was hoping that it triggered an alarm and a security guard would come because then I could say, yeah, I wouldn't be doing this if you wouldn't just unlock the thing and let me out. So okay. that happened. I got locked into a high school gym and, uh, went out a door I thought was a door it had been a high school I hadn't been to. I was in a courtyard that was surrounded by four walls of the school. It was just, yep. I had gone out the door in the middle of the school instead of out to the parking lot. I'm in a high school parking lot late at night. I'm in a high school courtyard surrounded yeah. by four and the door closed behind me. So I My had a pound on the there. door. I knew there was a janitor yeah. in there. I had a pound on the door until the janitor came, opened it up <laughs> and let me out and pointed me out into the parking lot. Yeah. Um, uh, but I would say um, the toughest place in that, in that regard was Buffalo, the uh, the Bills Stadium. It's a pretty good stadium. It's not the best. They want a new one, actually, and they're threatening to take the team out of town if they don't get one. I'm sure they'll get one now that they're such a good team. But if you after you're done, after the game is over, to interview, you have to go out, go down an elevator. Okay, that's fine. But if this is Buffalo, there isn't a direct pathway through cars. You must go outside the stadium and walk like three gates and back in to where the locker room is. It's not connected inside. So in September and October, that's okay. But not in November and December, it's freezing. You have to pull on your winter coat, your hoods, everything, and go out there with the crowd leaving the game at the same time because they're leaving when you're leaving. Fight the crowd to get back in and then go back into a locker room with steam and showers and you're wearing your winter coat. And you don't want to carry it around because you're carrying it around your recorder and your notebook and your pens. So you're wearing a heavy winter coat from being outside and you're going into a locker room, which is the hottest, steamiest place in the world. So that's not, that's not an ideal place. Um, but, uh, you know, and then, and then I guess Cameron indoor at Duke, I was there twice and the student section there right behind you where I'm sitting way closer than that bookcase, which is about five feet, four or five feet behind me. No, they're right. They're right up against your chair, literally screaming the whole time now they're respectful of our jobs they don't throw things on us they don't push your chair but they scream and yell and they're standing and they and you're typing away and behind you are the students and the student section at cameron is raucous loud sometimes raunchy clever but right behind you so that's a tough place to file you have to learn to filter out the noise when you're writing on deadline but yeah uh, it's <laughs> So, yeah, that's that's the most unusual place. Uh, you know, other places are very good. Um, usually the press boxes are at least shielded from the public. Um, 
postseason, you, your auxiliary press box, your seats are in the stands. I probably told a class a story about the Fearport Army in Miami, but Yankees are playing the Marlins in the 03 World Series. And we had a section in auxiliary press box. It was seats they carved out. They roped it off so no fans were allowed. They directed a giant screen TV outside. They brought us the stats, but we were like on a first base side, second deck, watching the game. The third deck above us was some luxury suites, and they guys were carrying it on, the Marlins around, whatever, and they had beer lined up on their ledge. Accidentally knocked the beer, came right down, splashed right onto my keyboard. I was so mad. Security guard had a, you know, I love you. Beer is bad. Beer and liquids and computer keyboards do not mix. So <laughs> you want to be careful in the press box not to put your, your Coke or your coffee next to the computer. It'll spill over. Yeah. It came down, hit my shoulder, splashed right onto my keyboard. I went dead. I couldn't write. So I was furious. I was just furious. And I'm not a fighter, but I was so mad. I wanted to fight the guy. And the, the security cop kissed. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I said, just bring him down here. Let me, let me get in his face. He said, nah, nah, nah. He went up there and he said, look, it was totally an accident. It didn't spill it on you. They were carrying on. We're going to make that. They're not allowed to line their beers up on the ledge. But I know that doesn't help you. But, but believe me, they didn't direct you or anything. In fact, the guys next to you were from the Miami papers. So they weren't targeting the New York writers, which I knew. I knew it was an accident. So yeah. mad. But, but our, um, one of our writers was a feature writer, Chuck Culpepper. He's covering the Olympics for the Washington Post right now. He's one of the absolute best writers in the world and a great guy. He was done with his assignment. He had a feature assignment. It was done. He said, Bob, you can use my computer. Just go ahead. So I just had to recreate what I'd written and, and was able to transmit on someone else's computer. And another computer, another guy said, if you have your thing saved to a disk uh, or a, flat, a memory card, a driver, I yeah, that in. But I didn't. I don't save it till the end of my trip. I didn't save it. It was in my computer. So so there, that, that was annoying. Uh, luckily, it was the end of the trip. It was between games. We came back to New York for the rest of it. And I was able to um, bring it into the office. I think they gave me a new one, and ultimately, they were able to, to fix it. I mean, it was a Newsday computer, but uh, that was – I was so mad. <laughs> I never get mad. I was so mad because I'm – and I don't drink, and I especially don't drink beer. I'll drink, uh, you know, a little sangria and a pina colada now and then, but I am not a drinker, and I especially don't drink beer at all. And I smelled like a brewery. A cup spilled on me all the way down. I come into the press room after that. I sit down to write, and, and the people that knew me said, hey, Herzog, I thought, I, I thought you don't drink, Sock. You don't drink. What's this beer? You spun? I said, I told him what happened. The guys that were near me knew what happened, but the others all said, yeah, right. That's, that's good, Sock. You're getting drunk in a press box. <laughs> and I smelled like beer. I mean, it was terrible. I was, I was pretty mad, but, but, but we got it done. We got it done. Yep. These are all like crazy experiences and crazy stories that you can now reflect on. And it's just, it's just a part of the job. It's just part of the experience. You know, it, it's unfortunate what happened to you in that instance. But um, I mean, I can tell you when I had to go to the dunk to call the URIPC game this December and the uh, sports information director put us on the baseline Rather than, you know, at the Ryan Center, we just sat like court side pretty much near the half court. Right. Uh, he put us on the base baseline. So we're not under the net, but kind of off to the side. And the student section was right behind us. So I was trying to call the game. I was doing color that day, but I was trying to call the game. I had the headset on and the mic, but the whole, I mean, they're crazy in Friar Town. They're crazy. They, the they are. And that's, that's why you have me wear head, screaming, headsets you know? post. The headsets are supposed to keep out the noise and yeah. so only you can hear your your other guy and the producer, but I can't imagine with all that. But that's Cameron. I mean, I can't imagine what the radio guys are doing it or TV guys at Cameron, but yeah, you know, that's part of the atmosphere. Part of the job. Yeah. The the last question I have for you um is just, you know, the best advice, you know, what is the best advice that you give to students uh looking to pursue a career in sports media like myself? Um, and, you know, taking on a similar path that you took? Uh, well, you're doing some of it. the uh, most important thing is to get involved, take advantage of what your school has. You know, I, I already mentioned the Daily Orange was huge for me and my friends in the business, including Bob Costas, two years behind me, but definitely on the uh, campus radio station, WAER then. Um, so take advantage of that because you just can't simulate um, 
the aspects of the job, the real hands-on part of the job in class. The deadlines aren't the same and the actual doing it, even professors with experience like me, we can't, I try, but I can't quite translate to you uh, exactly what it's like to do it. So do it as much as you can. So that's good. Um, uh, read everything if you want to be a writer. Read other articles, books, everything. You'll learn different writing styles and you'll learn about the sport that you're covering so that you're knowledgeable. In your case, you're leaning more towards the broadcast side. So listen to broadcast. Think, how would I handle it? I can't even watch like the Super Bowl. We just watch it. Can't watch any game without thinking. The first thing I do is look at my watch and see what time it is and realize, oh shit, we're on a tough deadline. They'd be on a tough deadline. I'm sympathetic. Other times like this Super Bowl, I say, okay, 10 o'clock, good day. Probably have an hour. They'll be able to get some quotes in. Uh, and I can't help thinking what angle would I take? What's the best angle? Who, you know, I would be the sidebar guy. What are the sidebars? Uh, I just can't help but still look at games through the prism of an old sports writer. Um, so <laughs> I, I say that um, read if you're going to be a, a, a writer. Listen if you're going to be a broadcaster. Um, you know, I told you this in class, be prepared, the old Boy Scout motto. You should never go to a game and not know what, you know, not know something about both teams, not know about the players. Be be, be prepared when you, when you go to an assignment. Um, be enthusiastic, be passionate, and don't be afraid to ask questions. You have to be curious. That's kind of what this business is about. So uh, those are, that's kind of a, a quick off the top of my head response to that. Yeah. I appreciate it. Zog, thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, go Yankees if, if we have a season. Um, <laughs> yeah, go baseball. That's what we need. Go first. baseball. Go, go URI. Um, I hope to uh, get some broadcasts of URI baseball and, and more opportunities down the line. And obviously, we'll be in touch and uh, continue to communicate. And hopefully, um, if I don't see you tonight at the Ryan Center, well, I'm on campus a couple times a week now. Um, so I'll definitely be in touch with you. And now that you'll be on campus, more teaching will We'll definitely uh, say hi if we see each other. Um, I hope you and your family are, are staying well um, during these times again. And, of course, uh, go Rody. Yes, and I will bring my grandson to a, a URI baseball game. We'll find you. He's a, he's a little prodigy, prodigy and uh, he I, loves I going the to the games. He comes to the, the URI basketball, and he will be, he, he'll be at a baseball game this spring. So we'll, we'll find you. <laughs> I, see, I see the tweets of uh, – that you, you post um, of him in, in the uniform and everything. And from what you've told me, it seems like he's the yeah, he's, next he's, up and up. So. Yeah, he's, he's, he's ready to go. I always tell my young guy, my, my young friends in the media, and you're one of them, remember the name Leo Fusco. He's it's my daughter's, uh, took my, you know, my, my, my son-in-law's last name. His last name is Fusco, not Herzog, but he's a Herzog. And uh, he's going to be something special someday. I, I predict that you guys will be writing about him or broadcasting about him, but I'm not sure which sport yet. Mm -hmm. Right now, he's good at all of them. But uh, remember yep. Leo Fusco. <laughs> well, we're still recording. And thank you. <laughs> thanks for thanks for having me. It's been great. And thank good luck. Yeah, I you. do appreciate it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Press I want for sure. You gonna need three put motors. I got the body from Jim Millis, but I had switched the motor. These badass bitch riding around this bitch and they all the coders. Yeah. I just told her make a story. Yeah. I just bought all the Trojans. Yeah. 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 yeah.